and we calculated that previously to be 4.8 times 10 aqueous and we'll set up our ice table okay do we have an initial concentration of anything right now we're just looking to find kft uh, and you really don't need to know much more than that um, we, in terms of, for these types of problems, initial concentrations, unless there's a common ion, if you're just looking at the solubility of a, a certain salt, initial concentrations are zero. Okay. We'll be looking at some common ion problems in a little bit. So the change, we're going to have plus x for um, both of the ions. Whoop. Sorry. And, um... Again, the stoichiometry rules still apply like they have previously. Uh, here our stoichiometry is just one. So at equilibrium, we're going to have x moles per liter of calcium ion and x moles per liter of oxalate ion. So our KSP is going to be equal to x squared. And as I mentioned before, uh, the molar solubility is equal to x in the ice table, okay, um, to the minus 5. So if we square that, we should get um, our KSP. I get uh, 2.3 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay, let's go back to thinking about what K means. We have a very small value for K. Is this reactant, for, reactant favor or product favor? Reactant favor. And it's going to be this, like that for all of these. You know, we, we know that we are going to put very little uh, of these uh, solids into solution. They're going to dissolve of only a very little amount. So we should expect some small values for uh, KSP. Yes? Unitless again. Yep. And we're going to see a lot of different uh, values for X, and it's going to be dependent on the number of ions that are formed in solution. Um, but you'll find a nice pattern with these types of problems. It's very satisfying. So uh, let's look at another problem. Let's look at calculating the molar solubility of calcium iodate. And this time we're given the value for KSP. So now we're looking for X. Okay, so what I recommend doing <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Is to write out your equilibrium, the solid in equilibrium with the ions. Writing um, or filling out an ice table and plugging that into your equilibrium constant expression. I'll let you work on that for maybe a minute, and then we'll regroup.
And then make your ice table. Initial concentrations, we have zero moles per liter of our product products. So we're going to be forming some amount X of calcium and some amount 2X for the iodate. Right. Don't forget that uh, stoichiometric coefficient. So at equilibrium, we'll have X moles per liter of calcium and 2X moles per liter of iodate. So then we plug this into our value for KSP, our KSP uh, expression. KSP equals 7.1 times 10 to the minus 7. Okay, we're going to multiply our calcium ion times our iodate ion squared. Okay, don't forget the square there as well. Easy thing to forget. And then we'll plug in our values of X. We'll have X for calcium and 2X, and that value is squared uh, for the iodate. So you should end up with 4x cubed for K equal to KSP. Okay. This is the, you're going to always get 4x cubed if you have one ion of one thing and two ions of the other at equilibrium. Does that make sense? Okay, but we are looking for uh, x, we're looking for the molar solubility. So we'll divide both sides by 4 and take the cubic root. And we will get x is equal to 0 0.0056, and that's moles per liter. Which means we can dissolve four, uh, 0 0.0056 moles of calcium iodate per liter of water. Okay. All right, questions on that? Fairly straightforward, right? Yeah. Um, I think I wanted to do one other thing. Okay. Let's tack on a little problem here at the end of this slide. Let's say that at some different temperature, we dissolve this uh, calcium iodate and we find that the concentration of iodate is at equilibrium uh, 1.372 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. Okay. Calculate the KSP at this temperature. So it's a different temperature than the first problem. So uh, go ahead and work on that. I'll give you a minute to think about it, and then we'll talk. Okay, so we are given the concentration of iodate at equilibrium. And we know from our ice table that we've done previously that at equilibrium, the concentration of iodate is equal to 2x. So what we can do is set uh, this concentration equal to 2x. So 1.372 times 10 to the minus 2 molar is equal to 2x. Everyone see that? Oh, okay. 
So we can solve for x, just divide by 2, and we'll get x is equal to 0 0.00686. And now to solve for ksp, we plug it back into uh, the equilibrium constant expression we calculated previously. Ksp is equal to 4x cubed. Okay. So we'll have 4, uh, we're in times x cubed, point zero zero six eight six cubed. Make sure you cube that first. Okay. And we should get a Ksp value of 1.29 times 10 to the minus 6. That makes sense? So here, um, the iodate concentration <coughs> because of the number of ions that are formed with the calcium iodate, uh, we, we aren't actually given the molar solubility. We, the, um, we're given the, the equilibrium concentration of iodate. With, at this temperature, our molar solubility is uh, higher than it was in the previous example. Uh, and then you can solve for KSP. Questions? Okay, so let's make more fun. So let's uh, add in the common ion effect. We saw this with our acids and bases. We, when we started talking about buffers, we had initial concentrations of uh, weak acid and conjugate base and, and a few other things that we've looked at. Uh, so, if you think about, let's say, um, the equilibrium for silver bromide, we know is a, a slightly soluble salt, it's going to form silver ion and bromide ion when we put it in solution. KSP value is very small, 5 times 10 to the minus 13. What do you think is going to happen to the solubility if we add 0.1 molar potassium bromide? And here's a good reason to know your solubility rules. You have to recognize that potassium bromide is completely soluble. Okay. So when we put 0.1 molar potassium bromide in solution, we're going to get 0.1 molar bromide ion. So now we have some initial concentration of product. What's going to happen to the solubility? Increase or decrease? Stay the same. Decrease, right. We're going to force the equilibrium back to the reactant side. So um, we can actually calculate what the uh, solubility of silver bromide will be with the addition of uh, potassium bromide. We can use an ice table. We are this time going to have an initial concentration of bromide, and that's the 0.1 molar. Okay. Still don't have any initial concentration of silver ion, and because of that, um, we, some of the silver bromide will dissociate, and we're going to have plus X for silver and plus X for bromide ion, so that at equilibrium, we'll have X moles per liter of silver and 0.1 plus x for bromide ion. So we can plug this into our equilibrium constant expression. Ksp is equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 13. And this is equal to x times 0.1 plus x. Now, if we can work this out, we'll get a, a, a quadratic, and you can solve that using the quadratic formula. But because our Ksp is so small, times 10 to the minus 13, uh, we know that x in relation to 0.1 is going to be very small. Okay. If there was no a, an initial concentration of bromide ion. Let's do a quick calculation. Okay, 
so no initial bromide ion. Our KSP is going to be equal to um, 5 times 10 to the minus 13, which is going to be equal to x squared. Does everyone see that? So it's just going to be x for silver, x for bromide. And so when you take the square root of 5 times 10 to the minus 13, you're going to get um, x is equal to 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay. Uh, we are doing a side calculation real quick. Yep. Um, we're, we'll go back to that for sure, but I want to show you some. Why, the reason I'm doing this is because I want you to see how small this value is, 2 times 10 to the minus 6. In relation to point 0.1, that's nothing, right? It's negligible. So that is the most that we could get in solution when we put sil uh, silver bromide in solution, okay? When we add the bromide, it shifts that reaction back to the reactant side, so even less is going to dissolve. So this number, this is the maximum you could form, okay? Um, so that's, that's one quick way of telling uh, if X is gonna be small in comparison to the, the number you're comparing to. But again, just getting familiar with the values of KSP works as well. Um, so we can ignore this value of X, and now KSP Back to our original problem, KSP is 5 times 10 to the minus 13, which is equal to 0.1 times x. And so x is equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 12. Okay. So you can see that an addition of a common ion has a huge effect on the solubility. Just 0.1 molar bromide basically makes almost none of that silver uh, <coughs> bromide dissolve. I actually don't know if I could, I have a lot of analytical, highly sensitive analytical tools in my lab and I don't even think I could measure five times 10 to the minus 12 molar. It's very, very, very small. Questions on that problem? So a good summary here is that the addition of a common ion decreases the solubility. Make sense? Really nothing new here so far, just a different value of K. So the next thing we're going to look at is what happens when we mix two solutions together, will a precipitate form? And you've probably done these types of reactions in lab, looking at the formation of precipitates. I think maybe developed a, maybe that's not you guys, looked at the solubility rules, did a study of that, and mixed things together and saw like white colored solutions, yellow solutions maybe? Okay, well, you're missing out. Okay. Um, <coughs> So basically, uh, if we want to know if a precipitate will form, that's basically saying, is a reaction reactant favored? In that case, a precipitate does form. Or product favored, uh, dissolves. Oh, there you go. So the way we're going to approach this is by calculating Q and comparing to K just like we did in chapter 15. Uh, so, if Q, again, we're using the subscript SP for solubility product, if Q is less than KSP, uh, then the reaction should go towards the products, and so we have a soluble salt. Uh, 
um, if Q is greater than P, uh, K, oh wow. If QSP is greater than KSP, reaction goes towards the reactants, and so we form a precipitate or we have an insoluble salt. Um, I should probably mention PPT is the abbreviation for precipitate. I think I might have said that once before, but another reminder can't hurt. And if Q is equal to KSP, the reaction is at equilibrium. So again, same rules comparing Q to K as we saw in chapter 15. So let's look at an example where we mix 100 milliliters of 1 times 10 to the 3 molar potassium uh, dichromate with 100 milliliters of 1 times 10 to the mo uh, minus 3 molar silver nitrate. Potassium chromate, excuse me. Okay, so I want you to picture what's going to happen. So we're going to have, here's a beaker of our potassium chromate. And here's, here's a beaker of our silver nitrate. And here's a bigger beaker, and we're going to mix these two together. Okay, so in goes the potassium chromate, in goes the silver nitrate. Now we've got a beaker full of stuff. All right. So our initial concentrations of the potassium chromate and the silver nitrate in the final solution, in the mixed solution, they're going to be less. Right? We've just, we're, we have diluted each of those solutions. So that's something we're going to have to pay attention to. Um, the other thing is that here, here again comes our solubility rules. Um, we need to think about the possible precipitates that could form. Uh, and this is going to be basically doing a double displacement reaction. And if you don't remember what double displacement reaction is, you can go back to chapter four. But really what happens is you swap the anions and the cations <coughs> and the salts. So for instance, we have our potassium chromate. So that's going to form, that's soluble, all potassium salts are soluble. It's gonna form the potassium ion and the chromate ion. And with the silver nitrate, all nitrates are soluble. So that's gonna form silver ion and the nitrate ion. Double displacement means we take our silver cation and we combine it with the anion from the potassium chromate. So that would give us, uh, one of the possibilities is silver chromate. And then the other possibility is mixing our cation from the uh, potassium chromate. So we mix the potassium with the nitrate and get potassium nitrate. So one of these is soluble and one of them is insoluble. Uh, oops. Don't need the two minus there. Okay, so all nitrates are soluble. So this one's soluble. We don't have to worry about that at all. So we're looking at our silver chromate. So that is a, the precipitate that could form. So the question is, um, will a precipitate form? Okay, so now we, we know what, what is the possibility, okay? We have a possibility of forming uh, silver chromate. But now we need to mathematically figure out if it's even a possibility based on the concentrations of ions that are gonna be in the solution, okay? Does that make sense? Um, so 
once we've set, uh, figured out the precipitate that could form, we're going to set up a QSP expression. Uh, and we're going to plug in concentrations for the ions of interest. And then we're going to calculate Q and compare that to K and decide whether a precipitate could form. About what we did in solution. We took these two different solutions and we mixed them together. All right. OK, so same slide, just starting over. Uh, so we're going to take our silver chromate, Ag2CrO4. That's a solid. And it's going to be in equilibrium with two silver ion, two Ag plus, aqueous plus CrO4 two minus. So we know that our QSP is going to be equal to the concentration of silver ion squared times the concentration of chromate, chromate, okay? But we need to know those concentrations. And that's why we go back to think, so we actually need to figure out the final concentrations of, of silver ion and the final concentration of chromate ion. So this is a dilution equation problem. Everyone remember dilution equation? You probably do. M1V1 equals M2V2. Okay. So we're going to have, an, um, our final volume is going to be the 100 mils plus 100 mils. So V2 is equal to 200 milliliters. Okay. For the silver, um, we know that when we put silver nitrate in solution, we uh, form one silver ion for every silver nitrate. So we have 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar silver ion initially. So that's our M1. And the volume of that was 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters. And so we're looking for M2. And our final volume was 0.2 liters. OK, solving for that, solving for M2. That's our silver concentration. That's going to be equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. Everyone okay with dilution equation? Okay, so uh, quickly then for chromate, same thing, essentially the same calculation. Uh, we have one times 10 to the minus three molar chromate and uh, 100, liters, 100 milliliters of that to a final volume of 200 milliliters. So we'll end up with a concentration <clears throat> of five times 10 to the minus four molar. So now what we do is we take these concentrations and we plug them into our QSP. So we're going to have QSP is equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 4 squared times 5 times 10 to the minus 4. And we get 1.25 times 10 to the minus 10. And we compare Q to K. So K, uh, given in the problem, was not, yet. Yeah, I did not give it in the problem. Oh, OK, well, I'll just tell you, because this is something you would look up in a table. Uh, KSP is equal to 1.1 times 10 to the minus 12. So in this case, Q is greater than K. And so uh, a precipitate will form. Salt is not insoluble. Or sorry, excuse me, salt is insoluble.
we'll have you uh, look at this problem. You can uh, work on this for about a minute. Talk with your neighbor. Wake up a little bit. Uh, which lead salt has the greatest molar solubility in water at 25 degrees Celsius? You're given three lead salt options and their KSP values. Go ahead and pick, pick your, the right answer. Greatest molar solubility. What'd you come up with? C? A couple of C? Everyone agree? Why C? Has the largest value of KSP. Okay. What if we had a, uh, a salt, a blood salt that didn't form one to one with its ions? So all of these dissociate. We have one lead ion formed. Oh, hmm. So I have a, I might have a, oh, there could be a, there could be, that could be right. We'll just go with it. Carbonate's two minus, so. Anyway, um, nope, just having a moment. Okay, uh, so what if we had a lead salt that they formed uh, one, one, uh, or let's say like lead phosphate, PB3, PO4, 4. Okay, now we don't have one to one formation of the ion, right? So now you, you can't directly compare the KSP values. So the only time you can directly compare KSP and take this out is when they're all forming the same number of ions in the product. There are going to be cases where, like this lead uh, phosphate, you're going to form three lead ion and four phosphate ion. Okay, in that case, um, you're not going to end up with KSP equals x squared, okay, and you're solving for x. Here you end up with, this is a fun one, KSP equals 6,912 x to the 7. Didn't look like a seven. Okay, and so you'd have to solve for x, right? And then compare x to compare the molar solubility. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so which of these salts um, would have the solubility given by KSP equals 108x to the fifth? No, it's not the last one. Which one? C, lanthanum carbonate. Sounds good. When this dissociates, you get two lanthanum ions, three carbonate ions, and so KSP is going to be equal to 2x squared times 3x cubed, which is 
4x squared times 27x to the third, which is equal to 108 point, or 108 times, 108x to the, fi to the fifth. What about for silver chloride? That's going to be x squared, right? For KSP. Like chromate, same thing, x squared. Magnesium fluoride, 4x cubed. Fun, right? Does that make sense? One more. Okay, this one's a little takes a little bit more. Um, so we have a solution containing uh, nitrates of the lead, silver, and tin ion. So we know they've completely dissolved their nitrates. Uh, and so the concentration of lead uh, lead is 0.01 molar, silver 0.01 molar, tin 0.01 molar. Um, all of these ions form insoluble salts with iodide, and their KSP values are given on the table. Uh, let's say you add solid potassium iodide until the iodide concentration is 0 0.001 molar. So we can decide based on the KSP values which of these will form a precipitate. Okay, all three, one or one of them, a couple of them, none of them. All right. So in order to figure that out, this is a compare Q to K. So you'll need to know the concentrations of uh, the ion. I'll make, let me do one here to get you started. So for instance, for lead iodide, the KSP for lead iodide is going to be equal to the lead concentration times the iodide concentration squared. And so we can plug in the concentrations that were given in the problem. 0 0.01 molar lead and 0 0.001 molar iodide squared. Oops, this should be a Q. We're going to compare Q to K. So Q is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 8. Q is greater than K, so it forms a precipitate. And you can do that for the silver iodide and for the tin iodide and see what you get. So I'll let you work on that real quick. Let me know which ones precipitate. Anyone figure out the Q value for silver iodide given the, these initial concentrations? So for silver iodide, I have Q is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 5. So you can compare Q to K. And then for tin iodide, same as with the lead iodide, Q is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 8, and decide uh, if a precipitate form. I'm going to go on to the next slide real quick. Um, I want you to work on this problem uh, for next time, but I'm going to give you the answer, and I want to make sure you can come up with it.
Okay, so answer should be B on, on slide 59. We'll finish up chapter 17 on Friday, probably start 19.